Hi, my name is Cody Rogers. I'm the Senior Regional EMS Coordinator here at National University's EMT program in the Division of Extended Learning. Uh, what you just saw was a video that shows a little insight into what it's like to be uh, in the day in, in the life of an EMT or a paramedic. Uh, I know a lot of things in there you may not have recognized or not sure what it was, uh, but that's really what I'm here to talk about today and really what our program's for. When you think of what an EMT is like in the day in the life of an EMT, most people realize you're working on an ambulance, you're doing things technical, working with patients, helping the sick, helping the injured, but a lot of people don't realize or even think about what the demographics are behind it, how much a job pays, and what a program's all about. We realize that people have a lot of options when they go to an EMT school or any kind of an EMS program, and we wanna do our best to educate you in all aspects of it prior to, in the program, and also after you get out of the program and you're pursuing your EMS or medical career. So the first question that I'd like to address, that it may be basic, but it really does matter that people realize what an EMT is all about, what the definition of an EMT is. So basically an EMT is a clinician that's trained in the basic life support level to respond quickly and efficiently to emergencies involving medical situations and traumatic emergencies. So to really make it simple, you're there to help the sick and help the injured in many different capacities across the board all over the globe. The first thing that I really want to go over is what is it that this certificate can get me out of the gate? And, and really, there's two different ways that we want to look at this. We have to look at it from two angles. The first is where can I go with my EMT cert in hand? Literally right when I walk out of this class, I take what's called my national registry certification, which is my national test that really solidifies your certification as an EMT and allows you to go into the working world and start going through the hoops that you have to jump through for state and county level certification. What can I do after that basically? And there's a lot of different realms that you can go that we'll get to in a minute, but more on a broad level because we realize most people aren't going into this program thinking, I wanna just be an EMT the rest of my days. I don't know where you're at personally, but most people think, I wanna go on to be a nurse. I wanna go on to be a paramedic. I wanna go on to be a PA or a physician's assistant. So there's a lot of different foundational things you can do early on, which is a great job, great experiences, but we tend to have a more broad range look at where we're going from there. And that's the first part uh, that I wanna talk about. So what are those broad range jobs just in a nutshell? The first is paramedic. Now I've already referred to that a couple times, but paramedic is that advanced level EMT basically. EMT is less training, you don't go through school as long, and in turn, as you can imagine, there's not as much skills that you can do, there's not as many invasive procedures that you can as a paramedic. Paramedic school is about two to three times longer in general than EMT school, uh, and then once you become a paramedic, it kind of opens the doors up a little bit wider for you to go from there into more uh, uh, broad range roles. Uh, from paramedic, we have nursing and nursing is more of that in-house uh, cl clinical position that you can go, and a lot of people don't realize that, you know, hey, I can go from a pre-hospital certification to an in-hospital clinical setting, and the answer is most definitely yes. You can definitely go in to the nursing program from there. You can go into PA school, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and, and EMT is a really good foundational level because what that does for you is it gives you a really good insight into what it's like to be able to handle patient care, talk to patients, get into treatment modalities, and just assess somebody at the basic level, looking at them from face value and saying, is this patient sick or not sick? And that's really that transition and that connection between EMS or emergency medical services and that allied health profession in a hospital like nursing or PA. Now the next one is one that a lot of people that come through EMT school go for, and you may not be going to this, but a lot of people do, and that's firefighting. It, firefighting is near and dear to my heart because that's the pathway that I took uh, right out of EMT school. I was in the fire service for about eight years and I, I worked in multiple states for multiple departments. Loved it. It's one of those high energy, exciting type jobs that you're not just doing the EMT stuff, but you're also working with car accidents, rescues, obviously fires, uh, all kinds of wide variety uh, types of calls. But EMS, and EMT is definitely part of that job. And nowadays, most calls in fire 
are going to be medically related. About 70%, I believe, is real, where it's at with the medical side. The only the other side is, is very small, and that's the fire side. So they have to have, nowadays, EMT-trained firefighters or paramedic-trained firefighters. Uh, so really exciting career, but that's another pathway that you can take. Now, obviously, the segue from this for a second is that these all have different trainings you have to go through. So I want to make it clear and not confuse anybody that you have to go through other training before you get those certifications. You don't just finish EMT school and now you're eligible to apply for a fire job or a paramedic job. You obviously have to go through more training, but the relevance here is that EMT is the foundation for getting into those different schooling certifications and job pathways. Another one that people don't tend to think about a lot, but it's definitely a job out there, I'd say for those of you that are looking to go in hospital or allied health, is emergency room technician or ER tech. Now this is that kind of job that really sets people up for going in hospital, nursing, PA, physician, respiratory therapist. So if you wanna go into any you know, realm that's going into the hospital setting, this is a great place for you to start. You're utilizing a lot of your EMT skills, that foundational level skill, in the hospital setting. So you're working side by side with nurses, physicians, uh, respiratory therapists, uh, the rapid response teams that respond to cardiac arrest. So you really get a good knowledge and insight of the daily operations of an emergency room and a hospital setting. Now the last one I want to talk to you about in the broad range is police officer. Now this is another one that people tend to think, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought I was going into for EMT. How does this connect? What's the correlation between law enforcement, and EMS. Just like I mentioned with firefighter, there is a lot of medical calls. Police officers respond a lot of the times, they're the first on scene to a lot of these medical calls where people are sick and injured. So they have to have this additional training and a lot of police officers nowadays actually carry uh, first aid kits and EMS type gear in their trunks so they can actually respond and do something before you arrive as an EMT or a paramedic arrives or they get to the ER or hospital setting. So it doesn't necessarily mean that EMT is a requirement for law enforcement, but it does mean that it sets you up for that, that path and that direction of getting your law enforcement training and maybe even making a little bit more money once you get on. And uh, never heard anybody to have a little bit more money when you get into the field of anything uh, with that extra certification. So the next category I wanna talk to you about is Transitioning from the last category where it was more broad range, what can I do with this certification after I finish school with you know, my card in hand, but then I have to obtain some more schooling or training and then it takes a little bit longer. This goes kind of backwards into, this is really what I can do straight out of school. I get my EMT certification knocked out in eight to 12 weeks and then I move on to getting my state and county certifications my testing's all done, you know, what am I eligible to do? This is a very important question for people because a lot of certifications out there, it may not be this quick where you can just go straight into a job where you have to go on to do some other training. But I, I'm telling you right now, with EMT, what's really cool about this is within, I would say realistically, four months time, and that's including your schooling, that's eight to 12 weeks, you can uh, physically be working in one of these realms. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, one of those jobs is obviously, we have to talk about it, is the traditional EMT. And that's the job where you're on an ambulance working in the EMT realm pre-hospital. Now that can be a wide variety of realms within that realm where you could be working on what's known as a single role EMT ambulance. And that's where you're working with dual EMT. So it's myself as an EMT per se, and then I have another EMT that's sitting right next to me. And we're running on what's known as a BLS ambulance or basic life support ambulance. From there, we have emergency room tech. Now I mentioned this in my last uh, category as well, but this kind of falls into both. It's that long-term pathway that sets you up for allied health professions, and it's also for what can I do right out of the gate at, with this EMT certification in hand. So again, just as a refresher and a recap, ER tech, you can go right into the hospital working in the ER or emergency room with other healthcare providers, setting you up for great experience uh, getting into those uh, in-hospital realms. Now the next few may throw some of you for a loop because these are really different categories than people realize. And this is really what my goal is today is to help you guys understand what can this do for me. And a lot of people think that it's more narrowed. It's just the couple that I've talked about. Maybe people before now just think, 
oh, I could just work on an ambulance. But it's really different than that. There's a lot of other cool occupations that you can go into that not a lot of people know about uh, before completing their certification and getting out there. So one of those is a cruise ship. Believe it or not, we have EMTs, paramedics, and nurses on cruise ships. There's teams out there that are just cruising the seas with all of these people on vacation. And it's pretty obvious why, right? We have people on cruise ships that get sick. We have people that get injured. And because they're not at a port per se, where they're not able to get to help right away. And even if a helicopter was to come land and take them, it would still be quite some time depending on where they're located. So they actually have EMT realms on the cruise ship. Not a bad gig if you ask me, because you still have to have days off. And on your days off, there could be worse places to be than on a cruise ship. Um, the next one, and this is another one that falls into the same category that's kind of odd and people don't tend to think about, but oil rigs. You have to have EMTs in oil or on oil rigs. Now, oil rigs, when I think of oil rigs, I think off the Gulf of um, Mexico. We have a lot of them out there, but I'm sure they're spread out all over the globe. So really, it's any oil rig uh, or refinery. You have to have EMTs located there to assist and paramedics. Um, obviously, those jobs, as you can imagine, are going to pay a little bit more than, say, your traditional EMT jobs because it's requiring or requesting a lot more from you where you're offshore and you're going to be there for a lot of days where, unlike on an EMT ambulance, you can go home at the end of the day on these uh, oil rigs or, say, cruise ships that I talked about a second ago, you're not able to just go home. So it could be weeks or even months sometimes. So those are going to pay a little bit more than your traditional EMT jobs. And as far as pay goes, I'm sure you're wondering, okay, what's these jobs pay? I'm actually going to get into that here in a little bit with you guys to kind of fill that information in. Last couple here. So the, the next one is casinos. Now, again, a lot of people don't realize this, but EMTs and paramedics actually are part of the medical teams or the sole medical team inside casinos all over the country. They have these people in there for the same reason they have EMTs on cruise ships and on oil rigs because is it possible people can get hurt and get sick in a casino? Most definitely. So they have to have EMTs that work there. Those jobs tend to pay about the same or maybe a little bit more than those traditional EMT jobs. The only difference is you're going to see a little bit different of an environment where as you can imagine there's no ambulance involved in a casino. You're just taking care of patients on site, packaging them and then you're getting them ready for transport with another EMS unit that's coming to pick them up. So you're solely staying on site of that casino, treating patients there. A lot of the times you'll have a room that you can take them to and do some further care before that ambulance unit comes to pick them up. Now the last one is EMS educator, another one that's near and dear to my heart because this is the pathway that I took. Like I said earlier, I was in fire and EMS for years and then I transitioned into the EMS educator role. Now, obviously, you're not going to be finishing the EMT program and then you're teaching an EMT program. Not a lot of people feel comfortable with that on the educator side, and students probably wouldn't feel too comfortable with that either. You got to get some experience under your belt before you get in there. So mainly what I'm referring to is something that I did shortly after EMT school, and it's not necessarily teaching EMT lectures, but it's going into the CPR realm. You could become a CPR instructor right out of EMT school, and the reason being is A, you have your CPR certification, it's a prerequisite for EMT school, and now you have your EMT certification in hand. Now, yes, it is probably beneficial for you to get a little bit of experience under your belt as an EMT beforehand so you have something to draw from, but you are considered a true content expert with CPR. If you really look at it, EMTs and paramedics, that's their bread and butter. So they're expected to be very knowledgeable and very insightful when it comes to CPR components and all of the numbers and regulations that come with it. So another job that you can do, and this is something that you can do on the side. You could be working in one of those other realms and then teaching CPR sporadically to keep up your skills and really educate the public, falling into that community aspect uh, and educating in CPR. So the next category that I wanna to talk to everybody about is EMT job market growth and wage. This is one of those things that if you haven't thought of, I'd really advise looking at because this really dictates how much am I gonna make? Now we realize, or hopefully you do, that going into EMS, you're not gonna be rich. Uh, I hate to break it or burst any bubbles, but this isn't a job that people go in to make boatloads of money. Now can you get to realms like becoming a physician or a PA where you're making a better wage eventually? Of course, even firefighter paramedic jobs pay well. But really, 
the core job of an EMT. You're not making great money, but it's actually become a lot better in the last few years than it once was. At one point years ago, we were really close to just minimum wage. And now we're actually getting up there to a decent wage. So again, this is a really important question that I'd really suggest all of you guys think about. Make sure that it's feasible, or at least for a small period of time. Most EMTs going into those realms I talked about earlier right out of school are only gonna stay there for on average about six months to a year. Could you stay there if you become more comfortable? You really like your job? Of course you can. But just by the numbers, most people go EMT, they'll work in that setting for about six months to a year, and then they're gonna move on to something else, whether that's another school certification opportunity to kind of keep going up and up so they can finally reach that goal that they have for that long-term career. So some of those uh, numbers that we're, we're talking about right now, the medium wage for an EMT and a paramedic from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics is where we pulled this from, so we're being accurate here for you, uh, is 32,500 a year. Now keep in mind, again, it's the median wage and it combines EMT and paramedic together. They don't unfortunately give on that website the separate realms. They, they push them together and give you that. It's gonna vary, obviously, depending on geographic location, what your role is, and then what it pays just in that area. That can really dictate what you're making. Um, so EMT wages, like I said, vary county and state. Um, for example, in San Diego County, we have two campuses there. Uh, I know you might be looking at attending our program in San Jose or Fresno, so I'll talk about that in a second, but we do have a couple campuses in San Diego, so we'll start with that. So San Diego County pays about 10 to $15 an hour for an EMT job, and I'm talking specific EMT job right now. I'm not talking on oil rigs or cruise ships or casinos. I'm talking your traditional EMT realm job on an ambulance, so about 10 to $15 an hour. Next is Central and Northern California. Again, I mentioned we have campuses in Central and Northern California. We have San Jose and Fresno. So you may be watching this to attend or considering attending one of those campuses, so it's good to know, and I wanna make sure we cover you too in those geographic areas. So in Central and Northern California, as you can see, it's a little bit higher, and the best logic I can come up with for that is just the fact that the cost of living, especially in the Bay Area at our San Jose campus, as you know, if you live there, is going to be a little bit higher. So they're actually competing wages for that higher cost of living uh, wage. And then in our Fresno campus or Central California, it can probably be more towards the low end of that range, 15 to 25 as it shows here. Uh, but it's gonna be close to that $15 an hour range. Now keep in mind, these are just averages, so it can vary depending on where you're at, the company, uh, and different job titles that you hold, how long you've been there, but that's just a rough idea to give you an idea of what am I gonna be making once I get into the field? How can I support myself and or my family? Another thing that's really important to know, and I think a very interesting statistic, is that employment of EMS providers is projected to grow 23% between now and 2022. If you're not familiar with job growth percentages, I will tell you right now, and you can validate this by researching it yourself if you're interested, that is a very high number for growth rate increase as far as percentages go. 23%, you can't really find other jobs out there that are growing at that pace. And that's not just EMS, even though I have just EMS listed here and that's what I'm really speaking to, that's across the board for all healthcare jobs. Healthcare is a very rapidly growing type of occupation, and we actually speak to that in great detail in class. We have some lectures that cover, you know, why are we growing so rapidly right now, and what's out there? What kind of jobs are we going to be experiencing, or, or calls are we going to experience? And that actually go, falls in. It may not sound like it now, but it falls into the same category of the growth rate. So what does that break down to in, in layman's terms? There are jobs out there. It's very hard to be actively pursuing an EMT job and not find one. As long as you're ambitious and you're really motivated to get that job, it's rare to have EMTs come back to me or one of my state coordinators that work at the other campuses and say, hey, I can't find a job. I've been looking so hard and I can't find one. It's not to say that you know, we're guaranteeing uh, you know, employment because we can't promise that, but the jobs are out there. It kind of speaks for itself. And again, we pulled that number from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, just so you guys know it's a valid percentage. Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about in this category 
is kind of a, a cool statistic or a cool number that I think is interesting and very relevant based on the category we're talking about. An estimated 240 million 911 calls are made in the US every year. Well, how does that affect us? How does that correlate to this topic? Basically, if there's 911 calls, obviously that translates straight to those EMTs and those paramedics are busy. Those calls are out there, it's that supply and demand effect. If those calls are coming in, EMTs are working. And if those EMT companies and paramedic units aren't fully staffed or they don't have enough people, well, they have to hire more. So really that just goes back into the same concept of those jobs are out there. Um, the, the market essentially in this realm is people calling 911 sick, injured. Uh, those jobs are going to be there because of that. So the next topic I wanna cover is near and dear to my heart, which is the details of our program here at National University. So far, we've already talked about the demographics of the job, what opportunities are out there, and different considerations before you enroll in any EMT program. Uh, we hope it's ours, but obviously these are considerations across the board for any program that I would advise that you consider. So talking about our program, a couple uh, details that it's really relevant for you to know, is we have four campuses. I know I've already alluded to that a little bit, but specifically, the two in San Diego, if you're a San Diego resident or considering going here, we know that some people might be geolocating to this area to attend school. There's one right in the heart of San Diego. It's actually our hub at Kearney Mesa. And again, it's a, it's a, a small community within the city limits of San Diego, uh, but it's a really nice location for anybody in the area because it's very centrally located. Now our other campus in San Diego is in Chula Vista. It's a lot further south than here. I shouldn't say a lot, but about 20 minutes south of our Kearney Mesa campus. Um, and the other two campuses are in Fresno, like I mentioned earlier, which is in Central California. And then we also have our San Jose, California campus, which covers basically the entire state. We have a couple campuses south, one in the center, and then one towards the top. Now, as far as each campus goes, it's going to vary based on what classes we offer. And in, within that meaning, what are the schedules, what are the days of the week, how long is each class? One of the things that we really pride ourselves on is really trying to focus on accommodating a wide variety of audiences. We have people that come into our program that are 18 years old, right out of high school, that are looking for their first certification to get them in that launching pad of going into the field of a job or a career path. We also have other people that are attending that have a family established. They've been in a career path for 20, 25 years already and they wake up one day and they say, hey, I wanna change. I wanna go into something that's a little more up-tempo and transition into EMS or some healthcare field. So we have a very wide variety and with that, we wanna make sure that we accommodate all of those people because we know that schedules and lifestyles are very different across the board. So our schedule is in San Diego, we have a day and a night class to accommodate all varieties of people with different schedules. Our, our day class is Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 8.30 to 3.30 p.m. And that's an eight week class, so a little bit quicker. Our night class and uh, the San Diego campus or also known as Kearney Mesa is 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. and it meets Monday through Thursday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights in a row from 5 to 10 p.m. and that's an eight week course as well. Our Chula Vista class, the other one in San Diego, is uh, we have a, two classes there. So our day class is uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8.30 to 3.30. Uh, eight weeks as well. And then our night class is an opposite uh, as far as not only being night, but it also runs a little bit longer. It's our 12 weeks. So we're giving people two options at that campus. Our night class is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays in a row from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. And that's a 12 week class. So in Chula Vista, to recap, we have a day class that's eight weeks and a night class that's 12 weeks. So we have different options there for people. In Fresno, we have a day class that runs Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. That's a 12 week long class. And then the night class is Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. The Tuesdays and Thursdays are nighttime. That's 5.30 to 10 p.m. And then the Saturday meets in the mornings, the first half of the day from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, then our San Jose campus is uh, we have a day class up there right now and that class meets Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. and that's a 12-week course.
All right, so our next slide here, our next topic, is National University's EMT program details. So we've talked already uh, with our program about the scheduling, which is really important for people to know what options they have, but just some other details that are really relevant for people are, first, that we're a nonprofit. Not sure how much you know about National University as a whole, but we're a nonprofit organization. Now, a lot of people don't know necessarily what the heck does nonprofit translate to, but I'm gonna make it really easy for you, and we live into this as well within our EMT program. Nonprofit basically means that our students are our number one priority. Uh, price gouging is not a thing with us, and everything that we have and we make goes right back into the program, which allows us to purchase really good equipment have the latest and greatest so that way when students get out into the field with this certification they're able to apply the knowledge they learned in class with the same materials that they used and they're seeing the same thing in the field so we really do a good job of taking care of our students and making them the number one priority and really focusing on them the next key component within our program details is that we're WASC accredited now what that translates to is just that we have a really solid accreditation uh, for those of you that may not know what WASC accreditation is, and I don't blame you if you don't because I didn't either, uh, but WASC accreditation is the same accreditor that it accredits the UC systems in California with their uh, accreditation. So we just have a really good accreditation which translates for you if you attend our EMT program. Those credits that you get, which are six quarter units, are able to be transferable to other pathways and other degree programs that you may want to pursue later. Uh, next, we, like I said, we have a, a six quarter units in our program that's academic weight, so you are able to transfer out with those and use those towards other pathways and certifications uh, or degrees if you decide to pursue a degree later. All of our credits are transferable. Our program meets all national, state, and county requirements. And our EMT is our national requirement. Title 22 is the California state requirement. And then NEMSI is another accrediting body that we make sure we abide by with all of our certifications in-house. Lastly, uh, we don't require any immunizations for our program. There's a lot of other programs out there that require immunization records. And if you don't have the right immunizations, you have to go out and get those. We know that can be a pain for people. So one of the things that we do is we don't require that uh, for our program uh, and that makes it a little easier with the prerequisites getting in. One of our advisors will be speaking with you shortly on our immunization requirements and all other entry requirements to our program. So our next topic kind of rolls right from our last topic, continuing with our program details. These go more specifically into the specifics of our program where the last topic was more wide range what our program is like as a whole what accrediting body we have, how many quarter units we carry, and some of the entry requirements. This really talks to the keys of what separates our program from other programs. Why choose us, essentially? So some of those things include our e-textbook online learning system management, which is called My Brady Lab. My Brady Lab is tied directly into our publisher that we use for our textbook, and it's an online learning system that really complements everything that we do in class from our textbook, and it's actually where all of our program homework lives as well. So students can go in there weekly, accomplish the homework. It's the same every week how we set it up so students aren't confused on what's our homework like. If you have to be absent, we realize that you can go in there and do your homework. You're not missing a beat with did I miss anything in class, anything that was handed out. The next thing is that we actually integrate our fee for the National Registry exam. As I mentioned before, the last step between finishing the program and becoming a legitimate EMT that's certified is you have to take the National Board Test, which in this case is called the National Registry of EMTs, or NREMT. Now there's two components to that. The first is the skills or psychomotor exam, and the second is a written test. Now we're not able to integrate the written test into things because that's uh, a contract that we and every other accredited EMT program houses with the NREMT and they have to go off-site. Students have to go somewhere else to take that exam and set it up on their own. But one thing that we do have control over is the skills exam portion. Now that skills exam is $150. Other programs across the country won't have you pay that up front and then if they do offer that, they will have you pay at the end. 
our program doesn't want to hide any fees from you. So we actually put that fee embedded right into the tuition. So when you get to that point, it's seamless and you roll right into it. In addition, that NREMT skills exam is actually built right into the schedule. So the very last day of class, you're not having to come an extra day or on a weekend if your class doesn't fall on a weekend day. It's just the last day of class, the same time you've met every other day, and we knock that out then. Another uh, nice resource that we use is called emstesting.com. Now the access for that allows students to get into an online testing module that's very similar like the National Registry written test. So we use that program for all of the in-class tests and it actually pulls from the same test banks and similar questions that you'll see on the National Registry. So the benefit to students with using this resource is that you're seeing these test questions all the way throughout the program and you're really preparing yourself for success. We have a very good percentage rate of passing that National Registry and I can attribute that to two main factors. One of them being we use EMS testing for our students as a resource so they're seeing those questions like I was talking about throughout the class and the other is that we have really high quality instructors that are true content experts delivering that information every day. Now our next thing is that our uniforms are part of the program tuition as well. We require that students have two different uniforms. There's an in-class uniform which is a t-shirt, uh, has our logo on it similar to the uniform uh, logo that I have on my shirt right now and then there's an EMS logo on the back. It's a uh, polyester cotton mix t-shirt as well as a, another polo or another t-shirt that is a polo I should say that they use for ride-alongs that students wear out in the field when they do their ride-along requirements towards the end of class. So again there's three uniforms that come with tuition and it's embedded in there. Some of the other things specific to our program that allow our program to differentiate from other programs and things that we've worked very hard to integrate are off-site things that are very realistic components to EMS. So what does that mean? It translates to being able to see these environments and touch and be involved with things in the field that you necessarily don't have to see, programs aren't required for you to see, but we really try to get that in front of you so you guys are able to have that experience and that visual aid with what you're learning in class and what you're gonna do. So some examples of those are we tend to take our students to the 911 dispatch center. Uh, that's not guaranteed at every campus. As you can imagine, there's a lot of logistics involved with setting that up. And it's different geographically with the contracts and relationships that we have. But we really try hard in each class to get our students to a dispatch center so they can see what that looks like. And what is it like for these dispatchers to take 911 information, listen to those calls coming in, and also what is it like as an EMT communicating to these dispatchers? So it's really nice to be able to see that right in front of you, tour it, and you have, you know, when you get out in the field, opposingly, you have no idea what a dispatch center looks like. The next thing is we try and incorporate other fun things that are really relevant to the EMT curriculum that include going to tour a medical helicopter. So there's paramedic and nurses that work on helicopters out in the field. And we try and get you guys over to the helicopter at least once in a class so you can see what that's like, where the helicopter lands, the crew gets out, and you actually get to listen to them talk about not only what the job's like, but if some of you are interested in actually going that direction, they can talk about that pathway of getting there. The last thing is our program does a really good job with our relationships and our contracts with our ambulance companies and fire departments in each community that we're located in with having companies come in and talk to our students directly. We like to do that towards the end of the class because as we know, you're starting to think about what is it that I want to do once I get out of here. You're really heavily weighing your options at that point and we want to facilitate that. Like I said earlier, we're not guaranteeing you know, job placement or guaranteeing a job right out of, out of the program, but we want to facilitate that as much as we can and help educate you in that, in that decision. So we have different company uh, supervisors, management level come in and talk to you guys as what am I going into, what are these companies like, what's the pay like, what's your schedule like. So we have people come from nursing programs, fire departments, EMS agencies alike and educate the students on where is it that I want to go and how is it that I'm going to get there.
So as I mentioned before, an advisor from our program will be speaking with you about all of the details and entry level requirements into our program. But just briefly, I want to cover the overarching cost requirements of our program. The total cost is $1,467, and that can be broken into two different chunks, half chunks, of $733.50 per term. Thank you for watching this. I really hope it helped you in your knowledge and understanding of our program and the EMS profession alike. Uh, we'd love to see you in our program soon, and if you have any questions, one of our advisors would love to speak with you. Hi, my name is Brandon Rivera. I'm one of the Student Services Coordinators with the Division of Extended Learning that services our EMT program here at National University. First, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation and kind of go over some of the things that we'll be covering in today's lecture. First, we're going to cover the prerequisites to the program and how you can go about attaining them, the processes to enrolling into our program, the types of assistance you can find, and how to contact your nearest representative for the EMT program. First, let us begin with the prerequisites. There are two major prerequisites here at National University's EMT program. The first is that you have either a high school diploma or a GED. Whichever one you have, we will be requiring you to submit official transcripts to our office, so contact your local representative to find out how to easily do that. The second prerequisite is that you have a basic life support CPR card. Now that can be attained in one of two fashions. The first is that you can attend a session with a third party provider such as the American Heart Association. But if that is not convenient enough for you, you can pay an additional fee here to National University and we will certify you as a part of your program. With those two easy prerequisites, you can start your career in the vastly growing medical industry. Now as a part of our program, to apply, you would first start by visiting nu.edu. You would go up in the upper left hand corner, click the apply now button, and scroll down to our certificate programs application. Go ahead, fill out our certificate programs application, and when you're finished, click the green submit button. That button will turn gray, which will notify you that your application has been completed, and it is time for you to contact your EMT advisor. You can do that by calling 858-642-8600 and talk to an advisor about what class you're interested in, whether or not you meet all the prerequisites, and what the next steps will be. Once you've completed the application and notified your advisor of your next class, it's time to submit some simple payments. The first is going to be your $60 application fee, and the second will be a fee for your CPR card if you do not already have one. Once you've completed all those steps, we're just one simple verification away from enrolling you into your next class. Most common things students often ask questions about and need assistance with is financing. Unfortunately, our program is not eligible for federal financial aid and we do not accept any veterans benefits for this program. However, many students have found success in pulling private loans from institutions such as banks or looking at retraining programs that have been funded by the federal government through the Workforce Investment Act. By looking at these two different organizations, you can find different forms of funding that might be able to pay for your EMT program at several different locations. So today we've covered the prerequisites of the program, how to enroll to the program, and what resources are available to you. Obviously here at National University, your best resource is always going to be your academic advisor. And you can contact your academic advisor in one of two ways. Again, you can call us at 858-642-8600, or you can email us at ems at nu.edu. For those of you who are still hesitant and would like to see our facilities, we highly encourage you to schedule a visit and a tour of our facilities. By doing so, we will show our appreciation by waiving your $60 application fee and assisting you through the application process. We look forward to meeting you, to having you in our classrooms, and to help facilitate your educational goals. Thank you so much and have a great day. I currently work full time and it's 9 to 5 and this class is a night evening course and it just fit perfectly with my needs. I enjoyed the instructors that we had. 
they had different backgrounds and different experience. I originally wanted to do fire medic and I came into contact with someone who was a physician's assistant and it kind of broadened my uh, scope of what I would be interested in doing and I'm now considering going into nursing school to possibly end up in trauma. That would be my goal. Uh, my name is Caitlin Olson and I just finished the National University EMT program um, and what I liked about it was that from start to finish everything was lined up for me um, from doing the CPR class to moving right into the EMT program after that and I really enjoyed the resources that were available to me uh, not only just the lecture was really nice but also all the materials and resources we had for doing the skills um, part of the EMT course uh, but the biggest thing was my teacher, he did an awesome job. I could tell immediately that he was really passionate about teaching and wanting you to not only know the skills and what to do, but just be an all-around good EMT. And he was willing to do anything he could to help you get there. Um, so I would recommend this program over any other program. And um, just because of that, honestly, the teacher and the resources, I'm really glad that I came here and did the course here.